let's get started. Last session, we started uh, sentence classification, and this is important. One of them is going to be sentiment analysis. We introduced a new data set, and then we introduced a framework, actually a couple of frameworks. One of them was recursive, recursive neural networks. The other one was matrix vector, recursive NN. The other one was recursive neural tensor network. And all of them depended on a tree structure. And then we said, we don't like the tree structure. Can we use convolutional neural networks? And the idea here was that we are gonna treat each word in our sentence as a pixel. So each word in a sentence is gonna be a pixel. And if you remember, pixels are gonna be represented as vectors that have red, green, blue in them. So K for pixels for images is three-dimensional, red, green, blue. But here K could be the size of your word vectors. So each sentence is a one-dimensional image for this framework. Then you have a filter. Your filter is gonna have a size of H. Every filter is gonna be a matrix. And each convolution is just a bunch of matrix vector product. So I have a vector and then you're multiplying it by a matrix, and then you're changing the dimensionality from K to M each round that you're doing your convolution. And then it's called the convolution because you have a summation over your filter size. That's gonna take as input a sentence, and it's gonna output another sentence. So it's gonna take as input a sequence, it's gonna output a sequence, but the size of the sequence is gonna go down a little bit. In the end, you're gonna need a single vector, that you're gonna do max pooling. This is global max pooling. Once you have a single vector, its size is probably gonna be the size of M, which is gonna be much larger than five classes that you need in the end, because in the end you're gonna need five classes. How good is this review? So you're gonna do a projection. So you're gonna introduce a set of new parameters. And then that in the end, that's gonna give you a bunch of numbers that you can push through your softmax that's gonna help you write down your loss function. But then there is a problem with that. You're gonna have a lot of parameters here and you want your neural network to get regularized. That's why you're gonna use a technique called dropout that you're gonna drop a bunch of your neurons for them to be independent from each other, to make them as independent as possible, not to rely on each other. That's gonna help regularize your method when it comes to the test data. And uh, that was during training. For dropout, you have two stages. One is the training, when things are gonna be random and it's okay to be random. But during testing, you want things to be deterministic. So you're gonna add, you mu you're gonna multiply by a probability. So what's your question? I think- uh, My question was, that. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, my question ahead. was regarding the, um, um, the dimension of C, uh, like the numbers of C. So it's N minus H plus one. And I wasn't sure how we got to that. Um, Oh, for that, you have to be a little bit careful. Let's say H is three, and then you have to write down the math a little bit. And let's say N is four, to see an example. Then the first round that you do it, you're gonna need X1, X2, X3 to give you C1. So we got C1. Then you're gonna need X2, X3, and X4 to give you C2. But then remember, you don't have any X5 because N, we set it to be four then if you wanted to have C3, then you would need X3, X4, which is okay, but then you don't have X5. That's why the size is gonna go down a little bit, depending on the H. And let's check it. This is four minus three, that's gonna give you one, plus another one that's gonna give you two. So you're, you're gonna have C1 and C2. Okay, so the math is correct. Does that answer so your question? Uh, yeah, I think I was confused because um, I thought that H is the number of filters and I wasn't sure how do we, why is it depending on the number of filters rather than their dimensions? Uh, so yeah, this is your filter size. This is the window of your initial sentences that you consider per each convolution operation. But then you shouldn't confuse this with M. M is uh, the number of channels that you're going to end up for the next layer. So M is going to be like K, okay? Then because then you can do the same thing. You can rename C1, C2 up until C whatever to be your new Xs. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I thought that just H is the number of filters rather than the dimensions. So uh, that makes sense now. 
yet one cool thing about convolutions is that you are sharing parameters. So now you, you are sharing the same W1, W2, and W3 for, and then you are taking that and then you are sliding it over this sequence. So it's gonna be the same Ws. It's gonna be W1, X1, W2, X2, W3, X3. That's gonna give you C1. But then for C2, you're gonna say W1, X2, W2, X3, W3, X4, and then that's gonna give you C2. Got it. Okay, any other questions? In practice, is something done like with images where they would have um, filter banks? And so like this is one filter, but then you do 10 of them in parallel at each round and come up with um, many C sequences? That's exactly what we are doing. So you could think in one dimension, but now we are thinking in M dimension. So in fact, you are having M filters. So these are M parallel filters. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. Okay. So in one line of uh, math, we are writing the same thing. So these are perfect convolutions. So if you know about images, it's exactly the same thing. But now your input image is one dimensional. So it's not two dimensional. You don't have X and Y coordinate. So it's only X coordinate. And these are 1D convolutions. Any other questions? Okay, perfect. Now let's take a look at it visually. Let's say this is your sentence. Wait for the video and don't rent it. So that's your sentence. You can think of each word as a pixel, if that's how you want to think about it. This is a pixel. And you can think of these uh, dimensions as the values of your red, green, blue color channels. Okay, you can think about it that way. But now there is no color associated with a word. You have a word vector associated with it. And then it's going to be k-dimensional. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six dimensional for this figure. While in practice, it, this could be 100 dimensional, 256, etc. Okay. And each word is going to have its own word vectors. Now what you're going to do is you're going to have a filter. Uh, and each filter is going to have a filter size. And let's say for this red part, the filter size is two. So H is two. So you're gonna take those two uh, entries in your sequence, and then you're gonna keep sliding the same filter all over the sentence. And then once you do that, it's just a dot product. You take that, you multiply it by your filter, you add up the numbers, and then you copy it here. So this is your X, this is gonna give you your C. And then you can have multiple, you can mix and match. You can have filter, different filter sizes. The question is what filter size are you gonna use? Let's use a couple of them. Let's say H is two, H is three, H is four, H is five. Just use a couple of them. And then each one is gonna give you a vector, which is cool. In the end, you want to end up with a single vector. This is your Z that you're gonna put in the rest of your algorithm. And let's say in the end, you're interested in two classes. And Z could be M-dimensional. That's what we are doing now. So we are doing max pooling here. You, you just keep the maximum of these values. You copy it here. The maximum of those values, you copy it here. It's going to give you a vector. Then you are going to multiply it by a matrix to give you the correct size in the end. One cool thing is that it doesn't really matter what number, uh, what is the length of the sequence that you're gonna end up with in the end. So this number here, n minus h plus one doesn't really matter because once you do the maximum pooling, you're getting rid of that. So whatever the length of this sequence, you're gonna keep the maximum values and then copy it here for the next round. Can I ask a question about that? Yes. Could we say something about, like if, you, if you're looking at a, a four word sentence versus like a, a 90 word sentence, you'd have like potentially worse accuracy on that longer sentence because sentiment would maybe get like drowned out across the like longer length. Yes, that's correct. And that's the shortcoming of this method. So you're exactly correct. So you can practice your sentence, maybe towards the end of the review, somebody is changing his mind or her mind. And then the sense of the review is changing totally. You're right. Will people try to like in their data set try to maintain some sort of constant-ish sentence length? I know that during training, you would try to do that because these usually go on your GPUs. And then you want your GPUs to process uh, multiple data points in parallel. 
So you want to process your data in batches for speed, but for testing, but that's just for computational efficiency. Mm -hmm. Okay. During training, you want things, you want your GPU to do things faster. So usually you, you sort your sentences according to their length okay. and then batch them together. But mathematically, you're right. There could be a long sentence and then suddenly the sense of the sentence changing. And actually, it's a good study. If you want to do a study on this paper, you could see what is the performance on shorter sentences versus medium-sized sentences and long sentences and see if empirically there is any drop in uh, accuracy of the method. So yeah, that's a fair point. And so let's see the performance in total on multiple different data sets. So on these data sets, you can do exploratory data analysis. Some of them are about movie reviews. Some of them are sentiment. This is exactly Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank. And you have two versions of that. You have the subjectivity, you have questions, you have, these are multiple questions. I mean, questions with multiple answers. Then you have customer reviews, and then you have opinion polarity detection. And then whenever you're writing a good paper, you're gonna do, you're gonna study your method. And for this method, what type of studies can you do? You can say, I need word vectors for my words. So these are the parameters of my model. The question is what happens if I initialize them randomly? And then you study that. These are the accuracy of your method. So out of 100 examples, on this particular data set, you're getting 91.2% of them correct. These are correct predictions. That's your accuracy. Uh, what happens if I initialize these word vectors using glove or word to vec and then fix them, keep them static? What accuracy does this method give me? But the rest of the parameters can be learned. W and Bs can be learned and WY. What happens? if I initialize them using word vectors from word to vec, but then I let it train. The other one is multi-channel. What happens if I include two versions? Basically, you're stacking them next to each other. So you're gonna have a word vector for weight. You're gonna have the same word vector for weight again. You're just increasing the dimensionality of your input, that's fine. But then you're learning, you're making it non-static. You're learning, let's say, this part of your word vectors, but then you're keeping the next one static. And this is what multi-channel is. So you're gonna have two channels and it's basically a combination of static and non-static. So you have some word vectors that you're keeping static. You have some word vectors that you're learning that's gonna give you multi-channel. And some of the data, on some of the data sets, it's giving you better performance and comparable to the rest. And in terms of the size of these data, in terms of the big picture, for MR data, you have two classes and each sentence in your class is gonna on average have a length of 20. So this is what we were discussing. Some of the sentences could be shorter, some of them could be medium sized, some of them could be longer. So on average, they have this length. On average, your data on SSD are around 18 and 19. This is five classes, this is two classes, two classes, six classes, two classes, two classes, and then these are the average length. These are the number of data. This is your vocabulary size. This is the vocabulary size for prediction. And you have the method that you use for testing. You can use cross-validation, or you can keep this many of your data aside for testing, etc. So any questions before I move to the next topic? So is everything clear? Okay, perfect.